recognition of Spooktober, I thought it would be fun to look at some of the creepiest music that has made it into a Nintendo game. And I will give Luigi's Mansion an honorable mention right now because I know it is widely loved for its creepy aesthetic and music. However, this list is for music that gives us an intense feeling of unease in an otherwise normal fun game. Because Luigi's Mansion is supposed to be spooky, it doesn't qualify for this list. So let's dive in. I'm sure that nobody will be surprised when the first item on our list is Lavender Town from Pokemon Red or Blue or Green. So many stories have sprung up around Lavender Town since the game's release in 1996 that it has become a famous creepypasta all over the internet. For summary, Pokemon is a game where you, a child, collect wild animals and battle them against animals. Sometimes these are other wild animals, sometimes they belong to other kids, meme lords, or gang members. Regardless, one of the most comforting things about the game is that even if your Pokemon loses a battle, it only faints, and you can revive it at the next Pokemon Center. Until you reach Lavender Town, which houses Pokemon Tower, a place for buried Pokemon who have... died? I mean, where else would ghost-type Pokemon come from, I guess? This unsettling revelation in a light-hearted kids game is accompanied by equally unsettling music. The Lavender Town music gave rise to the internet story about Lavender Town Syndrome in 2010. The creepypasta claims that the music led more than 200 children in Japan to commit suicide following the game's release in 1996, while others suffered nosebleeds, headaches, or increased irritability. The explanation was that these events were caused by the use of binaural beats in the music. It is true that the phenomenon of binaural beats can cause discomfort in some people, but there is also ongoing research into its use to enhance focus and concentration. There was also an episode of the Pokemon anime series that did in fact cause seizures in hundreds of Japanese children and so had to be taken off the air. There is no evidence of a real Lavender Town Syndrome, and it was most likely the conflation of the binaural beats phenomenon and the real-life TV episode seizures that lended to the believability of the story. Nevertheless, the game was altered to not include binaural beats. But even without the strange effect, the music remains very eerie. Why? The first thing we hear in the music is a very high-pitched line that continues incessantly. The intervals over the bottom pitch are a fifth, a major seventh, and a tritone. In another video, I discussed the music theory of why tritones are so dissonant and why our ears hear them as wrong. Here, there is the added confusion that if you leave out the lowest note, the other three notes neatly fit into a clear key. Add the lowest note back in, and they still feel like they go together, but we hear the low note as our home pitch. So there's a level of cognitive dissonance happening in even the opening four measures. Once the melody enters, there are several dissonances that are there to make us uncomfortable, not least of which is this C-sharp against a C. Not only is this a minor second dissonance, but it's also altering our home pitch, or tonic. That would be like walking into your house and finding everything had been shifted one foot to the left. You may not know what's wrong, but something is definitely wrong. Because it's a Game Boy track, this relatively short set of notes loops repetitively. Except wait, not quite. Another way Junichi Masuda, the composer of this game, makes us uneasy is through hypermetric displacement. It's a fancy term, but fairly simple to understand. The notes in this tune are arranged in groups of four beats, and those groups are arranged in larger groups of four measures. This 4x4 four four arrangement is pretty common in pop songs and soundtracks because it lends to a predictability that helps the listener identify what is probably about to happen. Except it misleads us. One of the lines starts over immediately after completing its four-bar phrase, as we'd expect. The other one sits out for a phrase, then starts over when the first voice reaches the second phrase. This means that the second repetition of the tune is slightly out of sync with itself. Not super noticeable, but definitely enough to make us uneasy. 
These musical effects are the ones on the page that can make us uncomfortable, but there are also the sound effects, slightly bending the pitch, adding reverb, and things like that. All these things together have kept Lavender Town at the top of the lists of creepy game music for more than two decades. Number two on our list comes from the peaceful life simulator, Animal Crossing. You catch bugs, make friends, design an island, and generally just do whatever you want whenever you want. Whether you like it or not, this game is super relaxing. It even features everyone's favorite musician and one of Kotaku's top-rated video game dog companions, K.K. Slider. He'll show up from time to time to entertain the townsfolk and slip a song into the player's pocket on his way out. He's just a laid-back musician running the gig circuit to make ends meet, and he dabbles in just about every style. Still, one of his tracks is still a bit shocking. K.K. Dirge. It has a decidedly different feel than the other tunes he performs, and its implications are troubling. A dirge is a musical lament for the dead, usually performed at a funeral. In other languages, this track is titled K.K.'s Requiem, or even just Scary Song. K.K. strums an open fourth on his guitar, starting one per measure. His melody line is riddled with minor second neighbor tones. We hear C as our tonic, but the half steps keep it from feeling secure. We can call it minor, but the fact that every stable scale degree is approached by a chromatic neighbor tone gives us a feeling of despair or mourning, which is intensified by these baleful howls interspersed throughout. After two times through the melody with a whistled echo, the drone speeds up to two strums per measure. K.K. sings the tune once more, and the drone speeds up again, this time on every beat. The melody is split up here. Stretching out the first half. Then moving through the second half as the strum notes build intensity, which suddenly erupts in this chord that's hard to name. It is made up of a tritone on bottom, a tritone on top, and a fourth in the middle, and followed by a long howl. The melody happens once more, much more slowly, and the song dies away. As spooky as the music is, its existence in this universe is spookier. That K.K. has this song in his repertoire must mean that at some point he was asked to write a dirge for a funeral. So who died? The Animal Crossing world doesn't really deal with heavy concepts like death, preferring a more comical approach to things like getting stung by scorpions and falling into holes. That hasn't deterred fans from searching for dark or grim clues in these games. In fact, it may just encourage them more. When the New Horizons trailer was released, many people caught a glimpse of a very out-of-place gravestone on the island. Fan theories abounded, with the most common verdict being that it was Tortimer, the elderly retired mayor of earlier games, or perhaps Joan, whose granddaughter has taken over her turnip business. Of course, K.K. Dirge was already available in the very first game, so certainly wasn't written for Dear Tortimer or Joan's Passing. But the curious gravestone along with the song itself does raise questions, as to what goes on in the Animal Crossing universe that the player may not see. Pikmin 2 sees Olimar returning to Distant Planet when his corporation discovers how valuable the resources are there, where he once again enlists the help of the local critters to plunder its riches. The game can be stressful, especially if you become attached to the Pikmin, because it truly hurts to watch them get eaten by a monster. 
Although perhaps the real monster is the one who would abandon his companions who have selflessly aided him in his goal to appease his corporate overlords. Still, the game isn't really all that scary. That is, until you reach the submerged castle. It's one of the final dungeons in the game and has its share of challenges, but the creepiest of these by far, especially for new players, is the Water Wraith. A vaguely humanoid figure, but made of translucent fluid, it follows you on two large stone wheels and will crush your Pikmin. Your ship's AI will note that even though it can see it, it can't detect it, and its body may be in another dimension. Not only is its nature unknown, and it follows relentlessly to crush your Pikmin, but you can't attack it. It creates a sense of impending doom and dread for the entire time you're in the submerged castle. The music reflects this perfectly. Throughout, the music is punctuated by this synth percussion, sounding at irregular intervals. The melody, if you can call it that, is a series of descending chromatic chords. This music is atonal, which means no one note serves to anchor us in a key. The feeling of being lost in a cave is created by the way the rhythms are aligned, or rather, not aligned. The meter is generally 5-4, which already puts us off balance. Occasionally, a measure of 6-4 will interrupt, just creating even more metrical confusion. On top of this, the descending chords happen only on off beats. Between the irregular percussion tones and offbeat melody, it is almost as impossible to determine a sense of meter as it is to determine a key. These descending chords create an ominous sense of despair. They are predominantly diminished triads, all sinking down chromatically by half-step, only to leap up again in the next phrase and sink all over again. Interestingly, the form of this mirrors the 12-bar blues, although with a very different chord progression. There are two iterations of the first progression, then a third happens at a higher interval, then the first repeats. To round it out are two shorter fragments before the first progression happens one more time. See if you hear the similarity. This has nothing really to do with the creepiness, it's just interesting. So as you wander the submerged castle, you're plagued by this incessant, difficult to decipher, but very unsettling music, which only hints at the greater, more incessant, more unsettling creature that lurks deeper in. Enjoy picking your flowers. Our next entry, contrary to my own rules, may very well be a horror game. Majora's Mask is one of the darker titles in the Legend of Zelda series, and moves away from both Hyrule itself as well as all the lore we would expect to find in a Zelda game. Link finds himself trapped in Termina, a parallel universe to Hyrule, where a Skull Kid in an evil mask curses him and threatens to drop the moon on the world. It's a harrowing scene. The residents of Clocktown are split between extreme fear of the falling moon and complete denial of any danger. Beyond the town walls, though, there exists a wide array of other problems, each with their own dark implications. The creepiest area, though, is Ikana Valley. It is a cursed place where the dead are forbidden to rest, and soldiers and spies killed long ago in a war roam the land. The main focus of the area is the massive stone tower, which Link must ascend to reach the stone temple. He can only tackle the tower after defeating the ghost of King Igostu Okana, who explains that the curse that plagues the valley stems from the temple. To allow Link to reach the temple, 
King Ikana teaches him the Elegy of Emptiness, which only adds to the creepiness of the area. This song allows Link to create statues or effigies of the forms he takes on by wearing different masks. We know that the masks Link wears are all taken from characters who have died. Darmani, the fallen Goron warrior trying to save his people from the frost. Mikau, who died trying to save Lulu's eggs from pirates. And the Deku butler's son, who we can only assume was killed by the Skull Kid himself in order to curse Link on his arrival. This makes the fourth statue all the more unsettling, Link himself. If you haven't seen the game theory video about this, it's worth checking out. This particular effigy has sparked a lot of theories and stories, most famous of which may be the Ben Drowned Creepypasta, which tells the story of a college student who purchases a copy of Majora's Mask at a garage sale, only to discover that it is haunted by the spirit of the former owner's dead son, Ben, who stalks the player using the effigy of Link. On the whole, Ikana Valley is one of the more unsettling areas in the game, not just because of the monsters we see, but the darker history that is only hinted at. The music echoes these characteristics. The first thing we hear is a single low piano note amid hypnotic ambient sounds which rise and fall, pulsating under the music. The melody is chant-like and sounds minor, but like so many of these spooky tunes, prominently features a tritone leap. The piano plays a non-tonal pattern, alternating intervals of a whole step and a major third. This creates two notes that sound outside of the key, E natural and F sharp. Like in KK Dirge, these notes that don't belong in the key keep us from feeling settled. In the simplest sense, major keys might sound happy and minor keys might sound sad, but mixing and matching generally creates a feeling of unease. The middle section of the song has a change of feeling. It still isn't settled in a key, but it does move in major thirds, which feels a bit more stable. By switching the orchestration to strings and a higher voice type, the sense here is less foreboding and ominous, and more wistful and melancholy, as though it is remembering a time when the valley wasn't full of death and despair. It doesn't last, though, as the first voice and creeping piano take back over, replacing the memories of an Akana Valley where a king reigned and a river flowed, with the image we see of undead soldiers roaming a parched, dying land. Our final entry comes from Super Paper Mario, known for its charming characters, bright colors, friendly locations, and wait, what? Oh, oh no. Just kidding. Super Paper Mario is a very intense game with a lot of dark imagery, including this horrible character we just saw that turns into a spider after breaking her own neck. The defeat and hypnosis of Luigi to act as an agent of evil, and the main villain's entire plan, erasing existence as we know it. This is one of those games that somehow snuck into the E for Everyone category in spite of being nightmare fuel. The premise of the game is this. A villain known as Count Black and his team of goons are attempting to open the void, which will consume all things as foretold in a prophecy. Mario and his friends must find the pure hearts to counter the power of the chaos heart before the void consumes everything. On their journey, they travel through an array of unique places. The scariest of these by far is the river Twigs in the Underwear, which is a play on the river Styx in the underworld of Greek mythology. Here, Mario must swim between ghostly white hands which reach out to grab him, and if successful, drag him down to join them in death. The soundtrack for this area frequently makes it to the top of creepy music lists. This is not our final musical entry though, mainly because what makes it creepy isn't really the music, but the ambient noises and sound effects, especially the backwards talking effect. 
Our final musical entry comes from a part of the game perhaps not as scary, but certainly more unsettling. One of the things that makes this Mario game different is that the heroes experience setbacks and defeats, and the villains get pretty far along in their plan. As the void expands, it consumes Samur's kingdom, as the heroes are attempting to win the pure heart. They are forced to flee, but notice the door to the kingdom remains. When they pass through again though, they find... nothing. It's a powerful moment when we're able to see the terror of Count Black's plan. The people of Samur's kingdom aren't teleported somewhere, and they weren't even killed. They literally vanished from existence. They didn't stop being because they essentially never were. The Void completely erased every one of them and their land. It's a difficult thing to fathom, and the music reflects that. Completely atonal and non-metric, this music sounds mostly random. But let's look at how it's not. If you'll remember back to K.K. Dirge, the spookiness came from the chromatic half-step neighbors. Every note we wanted to hear was approached by a note our ear wasn't ready for. The same principle pervades this track, although much more dissonantly. First of all, atonal means that there is no home pitch, which by extension means that none of the notes function with any sort of purpose or direction. With no home to gravitate towards, each note only exists in a relation to the note that came before and the note that comes after. So whereas with KK Dirge, the dissonant notes resolved notes that had a function, pulling ultimately to the tonic, the notes in World of Nothing exist only as dissonant to each other. We hear this clearly when the music box enters. We get four notes seemingly centered around D, then in the next measure we get notes centered around B flat, creating a half step dissonance between the D and D flat. The next measure moves a half step from B flat to center on A, but surrounds the A with the tritone E flat and Phrygian B flat to conflict with the C sharp from the major mode. Midway through, we get a big synth crescendo with a very disjointed melody. Look at how many of these notes are related by half step. Put that together with the rhythmic confusion of a quintuplet and we really start to feel out of touch with reality here. The end of the track has a descending chromatic scale, all half steps, ending a tritone above the opening note as the second loop begins. I want to look specifically at two of these lines. First, the bass line, which over the course of the track descends by half-step from F to C, sounding an octave lower than written. Second, the most unsettling part of this track, the persistent beeping pattern. This is a repeated figure that is out of sync with the meter of the rest of the track, and it always consists of three short tones on D, followed by a longer tone in a much higher octave. The first two of the higher tones are the half-step above and below the D, respectively, continuing that trend. The rest of the high tones rise by half-step from G to A. Because of the extreme range in which these tones exist, we don't really hear them as pitches that relate to anything, and instead they just come across as a nondescript sound. But when you pair the super low bass, which keeps sinking lower, with the super high tones, which keep rising, it conjures up an effective image of just how far the nothing of this world extends. It tells us that no matter how far we go in any direction, there's just... nothing. An additional creepy thing about this beeping pattern is how we interpret it. Like I said, we don't really hear it as pitches, and the fact that it's out of meter makes it feel like something else is happening that isn't part of the music. It could sound like the dial tone of a phone when your call can't be connected, or even the last few beats of a heart rate monitor before the long tone of the flat line. No matter how you listen to the music in the void, it is very unsettling and drives home not only the horror of non-existence, but also makes the player feel very, very unwelcome. So that's our list, and I hope you found it appropriately spooky. Without a doubt, you have ideas of creepy music in non-creepy games that has stuck with you, and I hope you'll tell us about it in the comments. I hope you liked this video and you'll subscribe for more like it. See you next time.